Welcome to the second of our series of videos on pottery analysis in archaeology. It's part of the Small Pits Big Ideas project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. I'm Rob Hedge. In this video we'll be looking a bit more closely at how to identify key characteristics of a pot and how that can help you get that crucial identification. Along the way we'll be looking at some online resources and guides but first of all, we'll go through the basic equipment you need to begin to look at pottery. There are a few bits of kit that'll make your life a lot easier. First, a pair of pliers. I like to use a simple pair of electricians or combination pliers. Good grip, flat front to the jaws, shallow serrations. Just make sure they're clean, no oily residues. Why pliers? Well, very often weathering can distort what you see in the broken edge of the pot as it comes out of the ground. Soft calcium carbonate rich inclusions like shell or limestone can dissolve in contact with acid soils. Clipping a shed to reveal a fresh break shows the unweathered fabric. If you can't see the broken edge clearly and you can't clean it up easily, don't be afraid to chip a little bit off. Take a firm grip and snip a corner. It should fracture fairly cleanly, though softer, older pots can sometimes crumble. It might seem crude to take an ancient artefact and break it further, but there's a sound logic. A clipped, identified shirt is of more archaeological value than an intact but unidentified one, and you can see how much clearer that clipped section is. A lens. You're going to need something to magnify your finds. When you're working on large volumes, specialists tend to use a binocular microscope, but they're expensive and bulky. This is my mini microscope, but even that's not easy to cart around. You want something portable. A hand lens, sometimes called a jeweler's loop, is ideal. Something like this. 10 times magnification is a good balance between the level of magnification and ease of use. 20 times will allow you to identify most inclusions, but it takes a bit more getting used to. You get what you pay for. There are plenty out there for under £10, and if you're just getting started, they're fine. Equipment stores for botanists, naturalists, geologists, or jewellers typically stock them. At the upper end of the scale, this is a very sturdy kite optics triplet lens with a built-in LED ring light, which is useful if you're working in variable light conditions. A suspension loop like this is a really good feature, it means you can hang it on a lanyard and you're much less likely to lose it. Acid or vinegar can come in handy for identifying inclusions made from calcium carbonate, things like shell or limestone, collectively known as calcareous inclusions. Add a drop with a pipette, and if the pot fizzes, the inclusion fizzes, you've got something calcareous. 10% hydrochloric acid works great, but if you don't have that, cleaning vinegar is pretty effective. A needle or a scalpel or craft knife, these are useful for testing the hardness of inclusions. Sometimes calcite and quartz can look similar, for example, but calcite can easily be crushed with the point of a needle or a knife, whereas quartz can't. A ruler or scale bar doesn't have to be fancy. Any stiff ruler showing millimetres will do. A rim chart is also very useful. This is basically a series of partial concentric rings. You shuffle the rim shed back and forth until you get a match and then read off the radius. Times that by two and you have the diameter of the complete pot. They also usually have percentages on, and this is useful if you're starting to think about the size and condition of your sherds. They're available to download and print at home. I'll put a link at the end. A word of caution, make sure that it doesn't shrink to fit when printing. You'll only make that mistake once. Now we've got to the point where you know you've got some pot, you've got it clean, you've got a good break to inspect, and you've got all the kit you need, but you're going to need resources to identify and characterise it. As we discussed in the first video, identifying your shirt is a matter of figuring out the fabric and the form. From the mid-18th century onwards, so in the last 300 years, 
Increasing mechanization, mass production, and cheaper long-distance bulk transport has led to a kind of standardization of a lot of fabrics. If you look at refined earthenwares like this uh, late 18th century creamware, it's very difficult to tell production centers apart because the clay has been extensively processed to remove those locally distinctive naturally occurring inclusions. So for pottery from the mid 18th century onwards, glaze, decoration and form are really important. For these, there are lots of resources out there. Because complete vessels from this period are increasingly common and popular collector's items, there are collector's guides and auction catalogues. Many British wares of this period were exported to North America, and there the archaeological study of these ceramics was pioneered. And so there are some loads of fantastic resources from North America. As you go further back, if you suspect you might have something a little older, then the ability to describe the fabric does become more important. And key to that is the ability to identify inclusions. You name it, it's been found in a pot. Quartz, flint, limestone, sandstone, shell. There's a whole flow chart that you can follow to arrive at an identification of the inclusion type. It's reproduced in the Portable Antiquities Scheme Guide to Recording Pottery, which also includes really useful explainers on how to do the rest of the description. I'll put the link at the end. But I find it hugely helpful to have visual examples. For this, a good place to start is the Worcestershire Ceramics website, where there are good high resolution photos of clean breaks with a scale. So you can read the fabric description and see what it looks like. Now we'll take a common medieval fabric for starters, Mulvernian unglazed ware, fabric 56. This stuff was made from the late 12th to the mid 14th century, roughly 1170 to 1350. Although some sherds may well be earlier as we'll see. The manufacturing center was between the Malvern Hills and the River Severn, roughly midway between Worcester and Tewkesbury. And this was mainly drab utilitarian cooking pots, though at the time the potters were producing elaborate decorated glazed jugs and pitchers. And it was very widespread. It got as far up the Severn as Shrewsbury and south and west into South Wales. There are three main inclusions in this fabric, quartz, Mulvernian rock and mica. Now let's take a look at the photo on the ceramics website to see if we can identify these. Here we go. The quartz in this fabric is like grains of sand, small rounded particles. Some are clear, some are white, some are pinkish. They're very hard. You won't be able to break them with a needle or knife blade. You can also see some large, more angular rock fragments in the photo. Some of them are dark red purple. That's the Mulvernian rock. And mica will usually show up as just tiny little flecks that glitter when you hold it up to the light. Once you've got an idea of the inclusions, you'll need to describe them. First of all, how big are they? Take an average. You might have some outliers. Here the quartz is mainly 0.5 millimetres or smaller, but the rock fragments can be up to 3 millimetres. Next we need to describe the frequency. This chart here is from Pottery and Archaeology by Clive Orton and Michael Hughes, a really useful resource. So frequency can be expressed as a percentage of the fabric as charts like this show. But given that it can vary within a vessel, I'm wary of percentages because they can introduce an element of false certainty. So you can express it on a scale, for example, rare, sparse, frequent, abundant. Next, roundness. Again, there are charts for these, Powers Scale of Roundness. And there's a sliding scale that goes from very angular to angular, subangular, subrounded, rounded, and well-rounded. Sorting. This is to do with how much variability there is within size. So if all the quartz particles are broadly similar in size, that's well-sorted. If you've got a range, but they're all between 0.5 and 1 millimetre in diameter, that would be moderately sorted. But if you've got some that are 10 times larger than the others, ranging, say, from 0.5 to 5 millimetres, that would be poorly sorted. You also need to describe the colour. You can do this with a Munsell soil colour chart if that's what floats your boat. But I think there's something to be said for keeping it simple. 
especially given the variety you can get within a single vessel. I limit myself to one main colour and one modifier, a secondary colour. So I would say the main colour here is brown, but there's undoubtedly grey in there too. So I would call this greyish brown, the modifier first, the main colour second. Now that we've described the fabric, let's move to the form. The most useful sherds for this are usually rim sherds, partly because they change over time, not always straightforwardly, but there are trends. And they can also help you to determine the size of the vessel. What I tend to do is draw little sketches of the rim profiles as I'm going through an assemblage. But to do this, you need to figure out the correct angle. A good way to do this is with a ruler. Hold it flat and tilt the sherd back and forth. If you've got it too bulbous, the centre of the rim will touch, but there'll be light around the edges. Too narrow, and you'll have a gap in the centre. Not all rims are perfectly even on handmade wares, so you're looking for a best fit, not perfection. This is broadly upright, like that. And once you've got that, you can sketch the profile. Some people like to use a profile gauge, especially if you're drawing for publication, but for sketches, doing it by eye is enough. If you've got really large shirts, you might be able to get a really good impression of the overall pot, like some of these. But they're a bit, if they're a bit smaller and more battered, then simple profiles of the rims will still allow you to compare and contrast with similar assemblages. If you've got a sizeable rim, this is where the rim chart comes in handy. You can slide it back and forth until you're happy you've got a match. The standard measurement is typically diameter, taken from the outer edge of the rim, in millimetres. Remember that to get the diameter, you double the radius. So now we've got a good description of the inclusions and we're, if we're lucky enough to have a diagnostic piece, we'll have an idea of the form and the size. Armed with this, you can start trying to find a match. We're going to look through the Worcestershire Ceramics database, but do be aware that through much of the last 6,000 years, potting traditions have been very regional. Fully online type series like Worcestershire's are still sadly quite rare because they take a lot of time, resources and collective knowledge to develop but they are starting to appear in other areas. Gloucestershire's was published online in 2020. But a really good place to see form illustrations and fabric descriptions is in major excavation monographs like this. This is Deansway, Worcester. And this, this is finds from Hereford City. Lots of these, including most of this wonderful series of Council for British Archaeology Research Reports, are available online via the Archaeology Data Service. But the beauty of the Worcestershire online series is the high resolution photos. At the end, I'll link to a guide published by Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service on how to use the search and refine functions on the website. But let's put in a quick demo to show you. Using this shirt here, I've already told you what it is and splurged the punchline, but let's see if we can find it. If you've some idea what period it is, you could refine the search using that, but let's assume you don't. So we can search here by inclusions. We know that it has quartz, Mulvernian rock, and some mica. Let's start by searching on quartz. You can see from the large numbers of results that quartz is a very common inclusion in pottery found around here, so it's not a great deal of help. Now let's add in Mulvernian rock. This is much more geographically restricted and it narrows our search considerably, but there's still nine to choose from, spanning the Iron Age to the 17th century. Now let's add in surface colour to narrow it down, with the caveat that this can vary even within a single pot. But take a look at the drop down options. Greyish brown. And here we go. Fabric 56, Mulvernian unglazed ware. Now you can go into the record and check that it all matches with what you've got in front of you. Bear in mind that variability. The record will have a main texture and colour section, but up here you'll see notes added. Can be fired to a dark grey. And here the colour variation is generally had to do with how much oxygen is flowing through the kiln or even where the pot is situated within the kiln. Now in the tabs along the top you'll see different forms. 
And you can scroll through to see the profile drawings, notes on the different forms and their dating. This is all based on their recurrence in deposits of different date, and this isn't set in stone. It can and does change as new sites are excavated. So here you'll see four different shapes of jar. The earliest has quite a simple rim, either slightly averted, so angled outwards, or upright, with an interned lip. This form is 12th or 13th century. Alongside it, into the 13th century, rims start to flare out, become more averted in pot jargon, and you get the development of a pronounced internal lip to see to lid. The lids were presumably made from wood. We don't tend to find ceramic ones that fit these vessels. And lastly, these wider jars seem to date from the first half of the 14th century. This is where rim diameter can come in handy. There's not much to differentiate these apart from being bigger. If you've only got body sherds or only one rim, it can be really difficult to refine these forms. And as I say, they're not set in stone. So this one came from Worcester, but it's not really a good match for any of those four we've just seen or any of the major types found in the city. It's a straight sided jar, but it's got a kind of cordon around the rim. But there are some very similar vessels, like this one here, found in Hereford. Specialists will get to know the characteristics of different industries very well, just because we see groups of thousands of sherds over and over again and get a feel for them. It's good to err on the side of caution. It's fine to say 12th to 14th century, rather than plump for false certainty. At least that's my excuse. And this, it's worth saying, looks considerably earlier than a lot of those Worcester examples. And in Hereford, these types are associated with a kind of mid 12th century date. So now you've got a good description of the fabric and the form, and you've worked through to get an ID for each. Now, general guides and resources. More period specific things I'll cover in subsequent videos looking at different periods. But here are some good resources to get you going. I've mentioned the Portable Antiquities Scheme Guide to Recording Pot. That's brilliant packed with good info, some specific to recording on their systems, but it's well worth a read. There are a few online type series, as I say, Worcestershire, Gloucestershire. You can download some rim charts, I'll put the links there. And if you're not based in the West Midlands, you might find there are local or regional projects that have produced similar types of resources. Examples include guides for the higher education field academies in East Anglia, um, online reports from Bingham Heritage Trails for the East Midlands. There are loads of them around, and I'm sure you'll find something useful that's specific to your area. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at pottery in a whole new light, and I hope you'll join me again for more videos looking specifically at pottery of different periods. Thanks for watching.